I'm amazed by people's abilities to build companies or incredible art. But for me to admire someone, that means they've done something that really touched my soul. You got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? Gary Vaynerchuk. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? I'm doing good, Gary. Good. So, um, so Gary, this is, a, this is a podcast recording for the Mind Valley podcast. But one of the things that we do a little bit differently is that we have a live audience watching us. So we have about uh, 170 people right now. It'll probably go up to about 300 people. And the audience, these are Mind Valley's biggest fans, have been helping me come up with questions for you. First, how are you going? How are you doing? I know the world has been so different lately. I lean into gratitude and perspective and accountability during these times. And um, that's it. That's all I can do. Well, one thing I got to say about you, Gary, is that I, I love the positivity that you bring on stage. Um, so just a little backstory, but I remember about a year ago, we were speaking on stage together in, in Sharjah, near Dubai, right? Um, you opened the conference, I closed the conference, but what really touched me is how when you got on stage at that audience in, in Sharjah, you were able to adapt your message, adapt your style to an Arab audience so effortlessly. Thank you for saying that. And at the same time, I've seen you speak in Vegas and it's a completely different Gary Vee. Um, this was at Tony Robbins Business Freedom Mastery Summit way, way back. Um, we've shared the stage several times, but we've, we've only met once at a pizza joint in Summit Series many years ago aboard a ship. But uh, just want to express my gratitude for I having you as a guest here. Thank you for having uh, me. Been watching you for 10 years and amazed at how you've grown. Now, because of how, in, 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 like when you speak, Gary, you just go on a roll. So I do not want to interrupt you in unnecessary questions. I want to give you a space to share your message to our audience today. The people who are watching are mostly 60% leaders, managers, entrepreneurs, and they are all here as part of the Mind Valley community because they love personal growth. And these 300 people showed up live because they love you. It's very sweet. I'm so excited to be here. Let's rock and roll. So with everything happening in the world right now, what would be your advice to entrepreneurs? You know, you know, I think it is going into, you know, it was funny when I just answered your question, I realized if I organize, this is literally how I create content. This crew will probably see a video tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern American time where the title at the top is gonna say, go into your gap during times like this. Because serendipitously, I decided to answer you with, you know, with gratitude, uh -huh. you know, accountability, and perspective. I ordered it differently, but as you and I were talking, I reordered it into spelling the word gap. And so, I'm actually gonna make that piece of content. Like I literally have just decided right here, serendipitous, never put those words together. So that's fun. And it's an insight to how I think, which is like creativity, information, being skilled at something, it requires omnipresence. It's not, you know, you know, you can go train, like I can go train to be a skier, but I'm not gonna be a world-class skier. For me, entrepreneurship and really wisdom and perspective came natural to me. It's my natural state. So, you know, what do I tell entrepreneurs? I tell them, this is what you signed up for. Like to, to really go there, what I tell fellow entrepreneurs is like, this is our time. Like when things are challenging, when they're difficult, when they're not stable, is exactly when entrepreneurs do well. A pure, a real entrepreneur, I don't like using the word real, but like an entrepreneur, not someone over the last decade when it got cooler, decided they wanted to be one, but an entrepreneur. Uh, it's like being a fish and now here's the water. Like to me, this is our time. This is when you have to navigate. Um, this is all we know. Like you've signed up for a world where you have to react to realities on a daily basis and it's all on your accountable shoulders. And then when they're um, incapable of going there, I deploy perspective and gratitude. I remind my friends, some who've been struggling, 
that if COVID started six weeks earlier, Kobe Bryant would be alive. You know, you can, you can decide to look at all the bad, you know, go look at the traffic deaths data around the world. You know, you start getting into scary debates of were more people's lives saved during this time than lost. It's half glass full, half glass empty. You know, you start getting into really interesting, thoughtful places. And so for me, it's perspective. You know, I think about World War II. I think about the Black Plague. I think about so many genocides. I think about the people and the millions of people around the world that don't have clean water every day, not when there's not COVID. I'm not capable of dwelling because of gap. You know, gratitude, accountability. You know, like, what am I gonna do about it? And perspective. And so I'm, what do I say? I say we should be thankful that we can even have this conversation, health over everything. And, uh, and let's, um, you know, let's, let's move forward. I love that gap concept. So gratitude, we get gratitude. Tell us about accountability. Accountability is tricky because people confuse accountability with lack of compassion. And I don't see it that way. You know, I view accountability as what can I control? And so, you know, when, when things like this happen, people blame, you know, people want to blame China. People want to blame their own government. People want to blame their boss, their spouse, the system. And oftentimes there's validity in those things. The question becomes, what are you going to do about it? You know, you can go political and talk about voting. You can talk about people that are in really suppressed places about leaving if they can. You know, some places you can't even leave, but leaving if you can. You know, for me, it's accountability. What can I do? You know, when a lot of our, in a very small, not as heady conversation, when my company is in trouble after, when COVID hits because clients are telling us they're not going to pay, they have to reduce scopes. You know, first I stop paying myself. Then I stop wasting money on dumb stuff. So I look at all our expenses. Then unfortunately the worst of the bunch, I have to let some people go so the whole company can pay its bills. You know, life. And so I like accountability. Like I like, you know, what am I gonna do about it? And I don't think it's fun or healthy to feel helpless. And I think it leads to a lot of bad things. That doesn't mean that I don't have compassion for people that are in precarious positions. It's just that I think it's very empowering for people to try to hack, to think, what are they gonna do? Now, the final one was perspective, the P. We've already touched on that, which is I use perspective and gratitude a lot. My perspective leads to gratitude. You know, uh, it, it could be worse, right? My perspective is it could be worse. Could. So as, as you went through this disruptive period, like what were some of the, the life lessons, the, uh, the big insights that you gained? I got affirmation from who I think I am. You know, during, ironically, oh my God, today is 9-11. So 9-11 was the first major event I had to navigate through as a leader. I was a very young kid in a family business. Then there was the Great Recession in 2008. As a, these are macro things. As an entrepreneur and operator, every day you're dealing with micro things, lawsuits, somebody's family's issues, clients, employees, but macro, 9-11, Great Recession. But I always, in the back of my mind, my friend, knew one thing. 9-11, I was a kid. I had, you know, I had no expenses. The Great Recession, you know, the reality was I built the business for my dad, not for myself the first time. So even in 2008, I really didn't have a lot. You know, I had an apartment, but not a whole, whole lot. You know, I didn't have kids yet. So I always knew in the back of my mind that I got, I was a great entrepreneur and I was fearless and I put the, everything on my back, but I really didn't have a lot to lose. So I always wondered, what would happen, not what would, when the next big thing happens. This is me five years ago, four years ago, three years ago. When that happens, am I gonna be as good navigating when I'm clearly losing things, money, leisure, you know, who knows what, status, whatever it may be, fun. And uh, the biggest thing I learned is I'm built for this shit. I'm born for this, you know? Like I went right into the place where I needed to be I knew what my requirement was as a leader. So I got affirmation of my intuition of who I am. And I think I'm a wartime general. I think I'm at my best 
when it's most adverse. And I think that's because I grew up in adverse situations. So it was, that was nice. So that was something I've learned. I've learned that um, people are, I, 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 I was affirmed my, my suspicion that people were soft and entitled. You know, this is why I keep going back to bat gap. You know, like I, you know, people like, we're not entitled to have everything come easy. I don't know why people think we are. It's not part of the life, you know, journey. Like look at history, you know, like bad things happen and like really, really bad things happen. And I think people have become too materialistic and, and have gotten complicated in their need for acknowledgement from outside forces based on commercial successes or what car they drive, status. It's a, we're a very deeply, globally, globally, a very deeply um, insecure animal. And we need other people's opinions for validation. And I wish people could get validation from their process not from the things that their process allows them to buy to make them look good to others. So, you know, I, I've learned some human truths that were suspicions. Um, and, uh, and I also learned that every situation is different. I'm speaking in generalities right now. There's 7 billion people, plenty of people have excelled, plenty of people don't need a BMW to look cool. They just like how it drives, you know, you know, more affirmation around me knowing that there are thematics I'm passionate about and I'm sharing them now, but every individual is different going through their own cycle. And I have a lot of um, compassion and empathy for that. That's amazing. That's beautiful. So the audience, uh, we now have 500 people live. The audience has a series of questions for you. Can we take some questions from the audience, Gary? Of course, of course. So the first question is from Jason Halzer. Do you still believe in the hustle? Absolutely. Now, I think the word, when I used it in 2009 a lot, meant hard work. Mm -hmm. I think the word has been manipulated in society in the last you know, half decade to mean burnout. You know, and, and so I've, I've switched using it more in a world of like, you know, people, you know, when a word changes its meaning to a large group of people, you have to acknowledge that. So I use the word work ethic a lot more. I will forever believe in work ethic. I, there's nothing accomplished without the execution. And I believe in work ethic and I'm, a, I'm a, a, not to the expense of someone's health or mental status, but I'm a very, very big advocate. I would argue that I believe in work ethic more today than I did a decade ago. So if you have to break it down, right? When you say work ethic, what does that look like for you? Like, you know, how you came up with that acronym GAP? Uh, uh, what is work ethic for you? Uh, it's like, a, there, there's, we can all agree that there's a certain amount of liquid in this bucket, right? Uh huh. To me, that's work ethic. Like, there is, like, everyone in here, and, you know, reading these incredible comments, observations, questions, everybody in here is got different skill sets in different right. things. So if I put in seven hours a day into learning how to cook, over time, I could be a much, much better cook, but I may not be as great as Jason Holzer or Jan McKinney or Anna, because they just actually had talent along with their work ethic. So there is a talent work ethic thing, but it takes an enormous amount of work to be Beyonce or LeBron and or probably every single person um, you know, here, right? Every one of us are gonna really struggle to not recognize that the hours put into our craft our execution, the time you put into your children, your employees, uh, making this, trying to figure out the formula for this. Like, you know, for me, it's listening. I spend so much time listening. You know, everybody sees me talking all the time, but I spend 90% of my time listening. It's why I have early observations on things, you know? And so I work at that. That's me putting in four hours last night, reading Twitter, Instagram, forums, Reddit, you know, like I read people's comments. Like I, that's why I have a poll. So I'm an anthropologist. I'm a strategist that way. So, you know, I believe in it. I believe it's putting in the work. It's, it's like push-ups. I think everyone here working on their craft and things of that nature, you know, 
doing push-ups. If you do eight of them, certain things happen. If you do 80 of them a day, a different thing happens. Now we all have different muscle composition. So some of us may show more, but the work is the work is the work. It does matter. Oh my God, that, that is so interesting because 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you told me that you literally respond to every customer email. Like back then it was email, right? This was like 10 years ago when you were running Wine Library TV. And, oh, and by the way, my friend, the reason the Gary V thing happened was the four years on Twitter where I replied to everybody who tweeted me and reached out to people talking about wine and then social media. Like there is no people know who I am without the work I put in to establish context. And then, and then my upside was predicated on how much value I was providing. I put in the work, but if all the things I've been saying through the years was to get people to come into my funnel and sign up for my course right. and, or like if I wasn't doing the right thing by people or, 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 you know, I have the receipts, they're all on the internet. You go look back at my stuff that I talked about in nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, a remarkable percentage became true. That's going to give me affirmation right. of a reputation. You know, people talk about personal brand and then people are like, oh, I hate that term. I'm like, call it what you want. It's called your reputation. You know, me being right about a lot of things was better for me than me being wrong about those things. Okay, so this is insane because when you told me about how you respond to every single email, I was like, I was incredulous. I was like, yeah, right now, but that's not gonna sustain itself 10 years from now. And here we are 10 years later. And you just told me you spent four hours replying. No, no. Four, and oh, last night, correct. Last night, now, right. now, that was a little different, similar but different. Last night, I was reading comments about subject matters. I did reply to some of my stuff. Right. To your point, it was not, you know, I remember when I was doing it, everyone's like, it's not sustainable. I'm like, and then it won't be. Right. I didn't, I didn't have my pride in it. I knew that it was a nice thing to do. I was learning, I was making connections. I always, to this day, I think this way. This is why, hopefully if some of you've met me, you've gotten a sense of me. I will never big time anybody. I came from the dirt. Yeah. Dirt. I don't have it in me to big time somebody. I'm, when I, I promise you, every time somebody says, Gary Vee, I'm so grateful. I'm so flattered. You know, and so I will never take that for granted that somebody appreciates my work, I, I will never, I will go to the grave. And I, by the way, on the record, I don't even think I've started yet. I love that statement. I really am telling you the truth. Like, you know, as you know, 10 years ago, I started making some juice. I'd already built a big business for my dad. So I had some credibility. And I mean, I'm in a totally different stratosphere than I was back then. And that's exactly how I feel right now of who I'm gonna be at 54, because I think I have good intent. I believe in what I'm doing. I'm working hard, I'm working fair, I'm, I'm doing the things that you know, lead to good things. Gary, what is it that really matters to you? Like what is it that you wake up every day excited to do and to give to the world? I have this weird blend of guilt and gratitude that I was gifted circumstances and an ability to communicate and I want to leave that. I want to leave that. I, I, I want that legacy selfishly. And I want my, the, I'm addicted to admiration, right? And I think that admiration is only earned. You don't, you know, admiration doesn't come that they're like, I, I, let me rephrase. My definition of admiration is you don't get admiration unless you really do something really meaningful, deep. Like, like I, I'm amazed by athletes. I'm amazed by certain people's general beauty. I'm amazed by people's abilities to build companies or incredible art. But for me to admire someone, that means they've done something that really touched my soul. Like left, like they're incredibly um, just kind and generous and, and just they are, their humanity is on a scale above the rest. And I'm very focused on trying to create that. Now, that comes at the contrast of being a businessman. That's not where the world is looking at businesses. But, but it is my truth. I, I love doing business and I love nice. I'm addicted to nice. So I wanna leave a, a legacy where people feel compelled to come to my funeral one day or, or tell their daughter a story or, whatever the social network of the day is or however we communicate, um, 
you know, to, to, to say something nice. I want to do that. I want to live that life. That is super interesting to me. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. And you definitely resonate kindness. I've noticed that about you a number of times. So here's a question from Adam. Please. Adam Please. is asking, I've been following you for two years now. Wonderful to hear you, to see, to see you here on Mind Valley. What advice do you have for people starting a new career midlife? Contextualize that you're early. I think a lot of people, when they think midlife, don't realize how early that is, and they feel this pressure that they need this to work. Once you take the pressure out that you might make this switch, and it might not work, which you can then go back to the old thing or try a third thing, if you could eliminate that pressure, because it's about calibrating time. If you have a good relationship with time and realize, at, how old is he? If you, could, if you can just... Was it Adam? I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Adam, how old are you? Post it in the comments. You know, I want to see it for context and maybe it's not even for him. Maybe Adam, if it's not for you, yeah. if it's for your mom or dad or somebody else, put the number of that age. 41. Yeah. And Adam, is it for you? You can just say yes or what have you. You know, like, you know, to me, if, if it's for Adam, let's say at 41 years old, he's uncomfortably young. Like there's a really good chance on a conservative day, he's got 25 years of profession in front of him, which is more time than he's already put in since he was 18 to 22. Think about that. But that's not what we do, my friend. We don't do that. We do not do a good job in having a relationship with time. We think at 41, we're old because society has done a very bad job of creating time because we're going off a of we're going off of old norms where people did live to 50 or 60, but we're living to 80, 90, and 100. And because of our health and wellness initiatives as a global society, we at 41, and mentally, the youthification of our society, all of a sudden 41 is really 25, but nobody feels that. And so, you know, that's my biggest advice, which is take the pressure out. You know, when I see Amber at 34 in here, like, fuck, man, I look at 34 and I'm like, ugh. By the way, I restarted my life at 34. At 34, I had spent my entire life, 12 years, building a business for my dad. In a family business, I didn't get paid what I was worth. I built a business from three to 65 million. I was never making any real money at all because it was a family business. You know, you inherit it when your dad dies. I leave at 34, I own nothing. I don't own the wine library. I have no money on paper to, get, to borrow it even. But I fucking built it. So I've had this huge 12-year accomplishment and what I get for it is to start over with zero and I'm thrilled because I accomplished what I wanted, which is I wanted to do something great for my parents. Wow. That took humility and patience. I'm at 34. I start VaynerMedia in the conference room of Buddy Media because I don't have any money for us to pay rent. I did not know that. So I'm, I started over at 34. Wow. And Vayner Media, what year was that? That must have been 2009, 2010. That's right. I was born in 75. Wow. Wow. You're about a year older than me. You know, that and, so, and so, you know, this goes back to excuses and accountability. Sometimes I meet people that are like, yeah, but your dad handed you something. I'm like, that's what you've manipulated my story into. Let me tell you the truth. So interesting. That firstly, so much respect for you. I did not know that part of your story. Well, I'll I, tell you why you don't know it. I'll, you, let me tell you why. Um, let me take it even further. Yeah, yeah. You know why you don't know it? Because I didn't want to make, I thought when I started getting notoriety that I didn't want to tell that story because I thought that it didn't shed good light on my dad. Uh-huh, right. I thought that some people would take it as like my dad fucked me. Right. Because I'm an immigrant and I know that our framework is different than the masses. Yeah, you were born in Belarus. That's right. So I, you know, I didn't want to, you know... I love yeah. my parents, right? I, like I, I just, and, yeah. and then it became a detriment because you can imagine after you do that, to live a life where people try to throw an excuse at you that the reason you were successful is you were given something when I was part of the very small 0.0001% that gave to my parents, fuck you. Right, oh my God, that, that, that's, that's a beautiful aspect of your story. Yeah, a lot of people don't know you were born in Belarus. Um, if you Google Gary, you'll see American Belarusian entrepreneur. My ex-wife was from Belarus, so, um, um, so you I know I, the culture. I, Belarus. By the way, with with everything happening in Belarus, are you? Do you feel a connection to that? Do you? Give I do, but my parents fear me being too loud about it because you know it dictate. You know the Soviet Union scared families, scared people. 
Yeah, 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 I know what that's like. Gary, the next thing I wanna ask you is, as you spoke about age and our perspective of age, one of the things I realized that I'm biased about is TikTok. You just, you've been raving about TikTok. My six-year-old daughter came up to me a week ago and she said, Daddy, you need to be on TikTok and I have an 11-year-old friend who can teach you. And <laughs> so in my mind, TikTok is like for kids. You are 45 and you are crushing it on TikTok. Tell us about that. Why is TikTok relevant? It's relevant because A, every platform that ever becomes a big platform often starts young and then ages up. Mm. You know, don't forget everybody, there's not a 17 year old on earth, a 20 year old on earth that wants a Facebook account and it used to be the most important place 10 years ago. Right. So for me, when something emerges and has that scale of attention, I'm always gonna go look at it because I'm a strategist for not only myself, but for everything I do in business. I might start a candy company or a sneaker company. So I need to know what's going on TikTok. Two, I need to know how to use it. So I always put myself you know, in that environment. Three, what's happened on TikTok is what's going on on TikTok, which is it is now dominant for 20, 30, and 40 year olds at scale across the globe. So, and that is with enormous amounts of effort from different governments to try to paint it as an extremely dangerous app doing things that you don't understand. There's been an incredible amount of media and government efforts, India, America, and other superpowers against it. And still the consumer continues to speak with its behavior. You can imagine how much it's resonating with the consumer. I don't, I don't have emotion. I don't have any opinion. I don't feel like my opinions on social networks should be other people's opinions. And I respect people's opinions. I also ask them to explain, you know, I've had tons of conversations. They're like, tell me how TikTok's dangerous. Well, it's China and they know, not, they know what, they know what, you, you know, there's not spyware going into your phone. We can prove that you can look, you know, like, so it's those kind of questions. I see. I see. So in terms of entrepreneurship today, what would be your advice to entrepreneurship in terms of building their personal brand, getting their message out, if they, if they just don't feel comfortable getting in front of a camera or sharing their voice? Find out if you're comfortable in a medium that does work for you, because a lot of people don't feel comfortable in front of a camera, and I understand that. Insecurity about one, the way one looks is a huge thing for the world. Uh, um, genuinely enjoying privacy and not wanting to be known out there. Like there's a million reasons why, and that's amazing. Maybe you should write. You know, writing is an incredible way. Writing blog posts, writing copy. Maybe you're a photographer and you can write a couple sentences. So all of a sudden Instagram works. Maybe you don't like to talk in camera, but you love to talk and you can record it and you can build a huge, you know, podcast. Find a medium that does work for you. And oh, by the way, if nothing can be found, then that's okay too. You're just leaving a lot of opportunity on the table and that's okay too. Mm. Okay. Right? So, yeah, yeah. An important point. And you know, this is what's fun about maturing. You know, I find myself articulating things out loud now that I used to think people understood and were assumed when I talked. So I look back at old content, I'm like, mm, I was more definitive. Like it was these absolute hard statements. And I thought that, and wrongfully, that it was contextualized through the breadth of everything I was saying. Now I think I'm more thoughtful of delivering what I just said, which was find a medium. Oh, by the way, if you can't, that's okay. And you know, but, but recognize much like work ethic, you're gonna leave some opportunity on the table. And guess what? If you wanna build a great business, plenty of people build it without building a personal brand. Now. If you build it, it will lead to things. Not to mention the thing that I'm doing it for. My great, 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 great grandkids are gonna really, really know me. <laughs> no, I mean this, I mean this. Like, yes, I like the fact that Gary Vee brings business for VaynerMedia and other things, that's good. But that's tiny. What right. I really like is my, when I'm 87 and I give some advice to my granddaughter, she's gonna be able to go back and look at something I said in 2015 that was consistent to something I'm telling her in 2064, and I think it's gonna land better because she's not gonna think old granddad is just trying to fucking tell her that. She's gonna be like, fuck, this guy really believes that. I love that, I love that. But Gary, don't you think it's getting way too competitive with social media? You have people like Jay Shetty, like- Of course. And they've nailed of course. it, they've turned it into of a course. Song. Of course, that's good. 
It should be merit-based. But doesn't that set the bar so high for the rest of us? No, no. It, it just means that what you're going to get is what you're going to get. That would have happened if those people were alive or not. Nobody, the world is abundant. Let there be no confusion. The world is abundant. Me and anybody else, we are not taking eyeballs away from you. There are plenty of eyeballs. That's right. just the truth. It's just true. You know, it's just true. The question you just asked is the same question I was asked two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, eight years ago, and there's many more people on now, and I'll be asked again in 20 years, and it's still gonna be the same answer. The world is abundant. You are gonna get what you're gonna get. Nobody's, you know, I've met a lot of people that are like, oh, that influencer's taking my audience. I'm like, first of all, it's not your audience. The audience is the audience. Nobody owns anything. Number two, there are 7.7 billion people on earth. There's plenty of audience for you. And if you're bringing value and somebody else is bringing value in a similar genre, because no two people are the same, they're gonna consume both. I, actually, good job, uh, uh, Sarma. Like, they're gonna, they're gonna consume both. That's great. Okay, so Kimberly asked, and Gary, I don't know how much time you have. I, 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 have, my, I have my internal team on a Zoom here now, so I wanna sneak one quick one in right now. Okay. Last one, I apologize. So the, the final question here is on kindness. Kimberly says she's so appreciative that you preach the, 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 the mantra of kindness. But Andrew Casey asks, how do you deal with people who try to take advantage of your kindness? Nobody can take advantage of kindness. People take advantage of people that allow them to take advantage. And let me explain that because it's very subtle. I hear this a lot. It's a great question. Thank you for it. You're not being taken advantage of because you're kind. You're being taken advantage of your you're being taken advantage because of two things. One, and this one really hurts people when I pick at them, especially usually one-on-one -on -one with a friend, is because you're letting them take advantage of you because you're expecting something on the back end and that was your way to get them in and when they don't deliver on it because you weren't candorous, you blame them, not yourself. Or you are wildly insecure and need affirmation and so you're just letting someone take advantage of you to feel a quick adrenaline rush or a, a hit of appreciation because you yourself are hurting. Those are the only two things. You're either trying to manipulate somebody subconsciously or maybe consciously, or two, you yourself are not in a strong place and you need a quick feeling of appreciation even though you know deep down it's not true and then it hurts in the end. Those are the only times you get taken advantage of, not because you're kind. I'm the kindest, oh man, I'm real kind out here and I'm not getting taken advantage ever. Amazing, Gary. Gary, thank you so much. We know you got to run. Thank you for making this appearance on Mind Valley. Uh, really, by the way, kudos to you on this format. The, uh, the pushback, the curiosities, the doubling down, the affirmation of the attendees during this brought an incredible dynamic, similar to why I really enjoy public speaking. And I, I can't thank you enough for innovating. I think it's a great format and kudos to you. And for all of you that were commenting here, real, real love, please feel free to say hello, any platform. I know you can find me. Bye everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Hey everybody on YouTube. First of all, thank you so much. So humbled for your time. I don't wear a watch, but time is the biggest asset. So thank you for watching that video. If, uh, if you got some value out of that, there's uh, plenty more where that came from. Feel free to check it out.